Okay. Welcome, everybody, to episode 97 of Dory Tunes. And we are very much coming up to the 100 now. And um, who would have thought we'd get here, right? Eh? Um, we've already obviously got this week's episode sources and next week's. Um, and we have some very special things coming last kind of few. So, but uh, uh, more details about that, I don't know. But let's focus on today. So today, I'm really honoured to have this guest. Known you to it for a long time. Um, it's been a long time coming. Uh, I've been a very big fan from afar. So um, I'll get them to introduce themselves, I think. I'm uh, sorry, I didn't catch that. Oh, sorry. So yeah, so I get you to introduce yourself. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> that should be simple. Okay. Um, my name is Winifred Phillips. I'm a video game composer. Fabulous. So Winifred, you've been, you've done a lot over the years. Well, as I mentioned before, we were recording, I've been looking at what you were doing previously. Um, and it's so impressive, the amount of work that you've done. You're like a machine. <laughs> <laughs> Try to be. <laughs> One of the things I always ask, one of the first questions I tend to ask when guests who come on the show is around about how you got to where you are today. So basically what I mean is everybody has a different journey to where they got to, how they got to where they are. Um, some people that I've spoken to have known people in the industry or had friends who just wanted to do a thing so they just worked along the ride and suddenly they're, you know, doing what they do. Some people went to university and studied physics and not music and then suddenly arrived to where they are today doing video game music. So how did your journey start? Well, actually, uh, my journey didn't start for video games. Uh, I made my uh, debut as a media composer working for National Public Radio. Uh, it's uh, our public radio network. And um, I was creating music for a serious series called Radio Tales. It uh, adapted classic stories from, uh, you know, the realms of science fiction and fantasy and horror and mythology. It would, it would adapt it for the radio and there would be uh, like wall-to-wall -wall score. So um, I was composing a lot for that. There were over a hundred episodes and um, oh, wow. it was, yeah, it was a tremendous learning experience for me. And it was my first big gig as a media composer. So it, it, I kind of think of it a little bit now like my boot camp. It was, it was where I learned uh, the basic ropes of how to be a, um, a composer at, as a storyteller, how to use music to tell stories. And um, yeah. because that, that's what that series was all about. It was totally about the medium of storytelling and music was just a, a another language to support that story and the way it was told and of course all of these stories were um in like larger than life genres it was like beowulf and the time machine fall of the house <laughs> of usher the telltale oh, heart yeah lots of really uh, inspiring stories and also some really interesting psychological tales like the yellow wallpaper and the birthmark and things like that that would um allow me to to explore music of a more experimental vein and try to create more psychological effects. And, and it was a great way to learn and grow and stretch. And um, so that was how I started. Uh, that's uh -huh. the kind of work I was doing. And um, it it when we were getting around to about 100 episodes, it was sort of winding its way down. It would, and I was kind of getting the feeling it was going to be over soon. And I started thinking about what I wanted to do next. Um, I happened to be playing uh, video games at the time when I was thinking about that. I mean, I've always been a gamer, uh, so it was, you know, it's just a, it's a pastime. It's a release. It's a great thing to be able to do. And I was playing the original Tomb Raider at the, at the time. And I remember uh, I was uh, going through the tutorial level in the ballroom and there's this stereo where you can listen to um, music it, it, yeah. while you're just, you know, learning the ropes and going through the obstacle course and things like that. And I remember uh, activating that stereo and hearing some of the music that's from the game, because that's what happens when you uh, start that stereo, the music from the game starts playing, like some combat tracks some ambient tracks, some of the things you'd hear while you were otherwise, you know, intellectually engaged playing the game now you can just kind of listen to it out of context 
And I remember that was when the light bulb went on over my head, uh, the idea, hey, this could be the next thing that I'm doing. I could be composing music for games. So um, I will never forget just kind of sitting there with the controller kind of hanging in my hand, thinking about it and uh, thinking this could be a big thing for me. Yeah. But, you know, you know, it's a big leap from having the idea to actually trying to get there. So once i kind of got that into my head i started trying to figure out well all right how yeah. does the video how does the video game industry work uh, what are game development teams uh, where are they what are they doing how can you contact them and uh, i started reaching out i worked with a lot of uh, um, indie teams and uh, uh, like little student teams and things um, things that didn't get released that didn't uh, see the light of day but that allowed me to sort of start learning about what game music is how it differs from the kind of music i was creating before i did music for uh, an M MMO that never came out and for a Half-Life mod that never came out and <laughs> basically stuff that never came out. And um, But it, it was a great learning experience for me. And around that time, I was also just putting out a lot of feelers, you know, a lot of uh, emails to a lot of different studios, just sort of saying, hey, I'm out here and I have this, this, uh, this credit a list from my radio work. And um, so I, I was able to show the sort some of the stuff I'd done before. And I happened to reach out to a music supervisor at Sony uh, right around the time that they were looking for composers to join the team for the original God of War. Yeah. Now, I mean, they weren't talking about it. This was all under wraps at the time, but my timing was just really great. And um, <laughs> so I, I connected with uh, this music supervisor and um, one of the things that helped me uh, was um, I'm a uh, classically trained vocalist, so I yeah. sing in I sing in a lot of my work. And uh, for that MMO I mentioned, I'd actually recorded my own voice into a lot of choral tracks, where you know I overdub my voice a lot uh, over and over and over and over again, and uh, just to make it into a full choir sound. And uh, so uh, the uh, game had a lot of royal families, and they were asking me to create these big choral tracks for that represented each of these royal families in this sort of science fiction universe so i had this suite of choral tracks and so i um, submitted it to the music supervisor at uh, god of war i mean i didn't know that at the time uh, just to as an example of what i could do and it happened to line up with the kind of style they were looking for. So uh, he asked me if um, I was going to E3, uh, the Electronic Entertainment Expo. And um, I said, yes, I wasn't. But you know, after that, I was. So I said, <laughs> yes. And then I, <laughs> then I, you know, I, I went and made the arrangements and, you know, made, made sure I could do it. And I flew to LA for the first time and went to E3, he went to E3 for the first time. And um, I remember seeing the booth for a God of War because it was essentially having its coming out party at E3. And uh, they had the uh, this uh, this statue of Kratos hanging from the ceiling, holding up a, a Medusa head in his hand. And uh, it, and it was uh, it was great fun. The music supervisor showed me some gameplay and we talked about what they were looking for with music for the project. And, and that was really exciting. And so afterwards, I uh, went back to the studio and I submitted some more music after the um, the conversation and that pretty much uh, locked it so that was my first project um, was the wow. god of war of course at the time i was also meeting with other people at e3 because i you know you're going to be there you got to make something happen so um <laughs> I, I so i so i also met with some people from high voltage software uh they were doing the tie-in game for the charlie and the chocolate factory film um that was being directed by tim burton and star johnny depp so yeah. they were looking for a composer for that and uh, I was able to show them some of the lighter music that I'd done and some of the lighter choral work that I had also done with like a female choirs, which really fit the tone of the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory franchise. So I ended up working on that project too at pretty much exactly the same time. I was bouncing back and forth like a ping pong ball between Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and God of War. Uh, and it was it was amazing. It was really cool. It was a yeah. great way to start. And so that's how I got my start. How do you manage to do that? I was thinking while you were, while you were talking about, you know, if you're working on various different pieces or, you know, games, how do you think, right, on Monday I'm going to do God of War, Tuesday I'm going to do Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Maybe Thursday, Friday, I'll do God of War, and then Saturday, Sunday, I'll do Shadow and Chocolate Factory. Because they're so different in their tone, you know, and the delivery, etc. 
how does that work? And I, this is the one thing I can never understand, but because how that works in here for you? <laughs> well, I think it's a part of two basic factors that you sort of hold close to your heart. And the one is the, um, the, the materials that the team gives to you. I mean, you're always looking for inspiration from what the team is doing and thinking about. And they have music design documents and game design documents and concept art and gameplay capture and all of that kind of stuff that you can look at and study and play and absorb and get your mind in the right place. So um, that's a big part of it. Um, when when I start work on a, a, a dark atmospheric game i'm going to be sinking my thoughts into the kinds of, of visuals they're giving me and the and the story that's supposed to be told and it kind of gets me in the right place same is true for a lighter project like say if i'm bouncing to shrek the third or one of the little big planet games i'm i'm thinking about that sort of lighter more whimsical more open-hearted full of wonder and adventure that kind of feeling and i'm really thinking about that as i'm looking at the the concept art and i'm looking at gameplay and and reading documents. And that's a part of it. Uh, the, the other part of it is really uh, the advantage of being able to do that. I mean, it's like a palate cleanser, really. I mean, it, it's hard. You know, yeah, it's, it's hard to get stale. It's hard to get bored. Um, if you're doing the same thing over and over again, it, it can get challenging to think of new ideas, because you're, you're constantly drawing from the same toolbox, you're reaching in and producing the same tools. And for me, it's always been this big old bag full of everything that I've been, <laughs> so I'm constantly going back and forth into different things. And so I, it, it broadens the, the tools that I've got. And weirdly enough, stuff I learned from one of the whimsical projects uh, can be flipped around on its head and used for some of the darker projects too. And, and you wouldn't really think of that if you mm -hmm. weren't in that position, if you weren't constantly sort of shifting mm -hmm. and morphing and, and turning yourself upside down to think in different ways. So I feel fortunate, actually, to be able to do that. It's, uh, it's great the way I started out as a game composer, because I'm not really put in a box. I, I do a lot of different kinds of things, and people know that. So they come to me for lots of different kinds of things. And it, it means that I get to be creative all the time and do different kinds of work, um, which I know is not uh, that common. Um, when, mm. when composers get known for one thing, they, they tend to develop mm. that as a brand, and then yes. um, clients keep coming back to them for the same thing. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's an advantage. I mean, it's strong branding, but it also means you're doing the same kind of thing over and over again. So um, as much as I think that may make good sense business wise, it's mm -hmm. it's a letdown on the creative end. So um, I'm glad that I have a career that allows me to do a lot of different kinds of things. That's brilliant. And how did you find or did you realize at the time when you were scoring stuff like God of War and for, you know, what the planet, how utterly huge they were going to be? Oh, well, um, for Little Big Planet, I sort of knew because I came in on Little Big Planet too. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And Little Big Planet one, I think they didn't have uh, that much of a sense of a team. Uh, there were, I think, a couple of people who were doing the music for that project, but it they weren't embracing the idea of a of a team effort. And um, once they moved to Little Big Planet Two, the whole idea was to reach out to lots of composers with very um, specific and unique artistic perspectives that could bring something unexpected to and and with a sense of mashup and and experimentation since that's really what little big planet's all about it's all about um unexpected creative leaps and um, unusual combinations of elements i mean it's, it goes from everything in the game from the visual uh, presentation to the sound of the game and um that that play create share feeling that sort of informs everything in little big planet so um, that really made a big difference in terms of joining a team like that so i kind of knew that it was a successful franchise when I was brought in, but for that one, but there are a lot of others where I didn't know it was going to uh, to blow up the way it did. Certainly, I had no idea God of War was going to blow up the way it did. Yeah. Although, although I did know that there was a an investment and belief in the game from the developers, the the studio. Just looking at the E three display kind of told me a lot about how excited <laughs> they were about what they had. So, and that really made me excited to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to fast forward a little bit because one of my favorite soundtracks of all time has to be the Sackboy soundtrack that you were involved in. Um, mm -hmm. And trust me, when I was playing it, 
and that song came on, I nearly wept with pure joy. It was so amazing. You know, even my friend and I were discussing it tonight. I was like, you know, Winifred did like that song. And she was like, no way. <laughs> oh, wait, which one are we talking about? Um, oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. I really did love doing that. That was amazing. That was, so much fun to work on. Yeah, that was phenomenal. It's one one thing that makes me a little bit sad about Sack Boy is it's not everyone. <laughs> oh, it's not. I, I, I know. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's not mm -hmm. on vinyl. Yeah, that maybe someday it will be. I, I don't, maybe. I, I mean, I know that it's a complicated process with the music of the Little Big Planet now the Sackboy games because it's a combination of a lot of original music, license. I mean, a ton of original music, and then a lot of license. And yeah. so I think they have a lot of considerations that they have mm -hmm. to think about. Yeah. Plus, I mean, just with Material Girl, that is uh, a essentially it's sort of a license, but it's not because I'm creating a new version of it, but they're still, yeah. you know, more complicated rights. I mean, um, it's, the song itself is a part of the Sony family, so mm -hmm. that makes things more more simple Easier. for them. But yeah, yeah. but still, I, I don't know what the uh, what what the what would go into um, making a vinyl of that. Although I would love to see it. I think the yeah. fans would love to see it too. I think that would be really cool. It's something yeah. that comes up quite a lot. I'm on a Discord for uh, video game vinyl collectors, and it's something that comes up quite a lot. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> It's very, very uh, low. That's yeah. that's really nice to hear. <laughs> and I mean, as I said, you've you've done so much stuff, like even Assassin's Creed. You know, it's just bonkers for here. I remember that because I remember the, the the visuals and I remember the, the artwork and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and you've done Speed Racer, which Speed Racer is one of the best films of all time. Let's just be honest. <laughs> right, yeah, it was it was really a lot of fun to do the music for Speed Racer, and uh, I mean, I got a chance to see some of the uh, visuals from the film early, uh, just oh, wow. to, yeah, well, because just a tiny snippet, really, but just yeah. to, because it was informing the whole uh, development team in mm -hmm. in terms of what they were doing, so um, just a sense of what the racing was going to be like, and uh, so that was really awesome. Mm -hmm. And was there a point where you thought? I am actually doing what I said I'm doing. I'm composing for video games, and this is all I'm doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, I think that did happen. But, you know, part of it, at least for me, I knew when I was going to get into uh, going after video games as a career that it was going to be like a, an uphill battle, but essentially an up the wall because it's just t totally up. So I knew I really did know it was going to be super, super hard. And um, so I don't know if I've ever really thought, oh, wow, I'm I'm a video game composer. It's a miracle because <laughs> it's it, it is a uh, it, it's a mission uh, for me. It, uh, and uh, th and that's part of what makes it uh, special. I, I really I, I feel like video games are a magnificent way to tell stories and to engage people. It's uh, it's an active experience for players. They're they're emotionally invested and involved in a way that they aren't when they're just passively listening or passively watching, like for a radio show or a television show or a film. You're just passively observing the experience, and, and may, I mean it may touch you and it may move you, it may make you think, but it's not going to become a part of your lived experience as. As a person because you're not making choices you don't have any agency it you're not a, a participant in what's happening whereas with games you are you are a participant in what's happening you're making choices you're shaping your experience and you're getting a sense of personal uh, accomplishment and fulfillment by what you're doing and yeah. as a part of that you, the experience becomes so much more memorable particularly in terms of the music you're hearing while you're doing that music that you hear while you're accomplishing something or engaged in an activity that means something to you uh, mu that music forms a deeper imprint on your memory than anything else that you would hear um, you remember that music Yes. You remember it better than you'd remember music from television or film. So uh, in a lot of ways, that means that a, a career as a game composer is a more intimate experience in terms of communicating with your with with players, with the audience. And that is has been really important to me. And so yes. it, it 
that's uh, it really defined how I think about what I do as a composer. And it's it's funny you should say that because I was speaking to Katia Lenko, who was obviously on the way to volume two recently. And when we were recording, she got very, very tearful about a particular piece of music that actually he's had for years and years and years. He's trying to get it into our way, couldn't. And then he managed to get it into that in a very short scene. And it's a beautiful little piece. And I kind of, I, I this, when I was playing it, it came on. And the second it came on, I was like, this is the bit he's talking about. This is the piece of music. So, you know, emotional about. And it, it, I find game really, you know, that's the kind of bonus that we get. We get to put our emotions almost into the games as well. And we get that back, you know. Um, there are several games that I've sat down, had a little cry afterwards, like the game game. Um, which was amazing, bonkers. You know, everybody's gone to rapture and always mm -hmm. cry. You know, there's particular scenes that make me like that. You know, so many journey, you know, there are lots and lots of other ones, you know. Pick again. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, and I think that's a wonderful skill to be able to have to be able to do that to someone that you don't even know. Mm. Yeah, I know what you mean. It, uh, I feel very privileged to create music for games. I, I just, I feel like uh, video games are a very important mode of storytelling and that it, in a way harkens back to the earliest forms of storytelling when you gather around a fire and someone would talk to you because you were present then. And it was, it was a, a relationship you were having with the storyteller and your presence was important in the, in the spinning of the, of the tale. Mm -hmm. um, in, and in a way that mirrors how our presence as gamers is important to the unfolding of the story um, in video games. Whereas you can imagine a, a film, a television show will play without you if you walk out of the room, but a game will stop. <laughs> if you're not if you're not there yeah this is true and it's funny my partner is not a gamer whatsoever but really got kind of gets sucked in sometimes mm -hmm. often playing um, so kind of when the cutscenes come on it's like you know, kind of um what's the word i'm looking for he mouths the same words you know he kind of makes a funny thing up instead you know and they're talking really seriously about somebody dying Something that happened, ter terrible happened. He's just making we were joking back then. He always makes you laugh. But um, he's, he can see that there's storytelling there. He can see, you know, bang, bang, you know, you're dead, whatever. Um, and he's really seen that with um, stuff like The Last of Us. I remember I showed him the trailer before it came out last year. And I said, We're going to watch this in January. We're going to enjoy this. And he watched the trailer and went, you know, and then it was like every week, you know, watching religiously and just absolutely. And I'm sorry, but if, if, have you seen The Last of Us yet? Oh, no, I haven't. Not yet. Okay. I, I've heard, I've heard good things, certainly. Um, I, th I think episode three to me was the pinnacle of the whole series. It's just, you know, um, it was a very, very special place for so, and it can be watched without watching the rest of the series. Just saying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll be sure to check it out then. <laughs> <laughs> so, over the years, you've done so many other things. You've written a book. Mm. Yeah. And you've won countless awards. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a part of the whole process. I, I'm, I mean, the book, it was especially important to me. Mm. Uh, uh, there were... This was around the time, well, actually right before I started work on Assassin's Creed Liberation. And um, I had been thinking about um, the fact that there wasn't really a book available um, for, uh, for game music composers specifically that addressed our needs. I mean, there were a lot of books that were more general that were about game audio as a whole. And they don't have chapters about game music, but it wasn't really focused specifically on what game composers need. It was more sort of uh, addressing jack of all trades or people who would come in and, and fulfill all of the aspects of game audio. They'd be sound designers slash composers who kind of did everything. And so that focus 
that was sort of diffuse across all of the various uh, assets you'd need to create. Um, it didn't really address what I would need to know as just a game composer fo focused specifically on game music. Um, it, and the kind of questions that I had artistically about what I should be thinking about and the kinds of uh, choices I should be making as a person who makes music, they just wasn't really addressed in books at the time. So, um, so I, that was when I kind of do it. <laughs> <laughs> was actually my music producer's idea. Uh, she uh, just kind of turned to me at one point and said, uh, don't you think you should write it yourself? <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it, it essentially kind of said, you're at, you're at that point, you really should just go do it. And um, so I uh, put together a proposal, sent it to the MIT press and they liked it. And I got went under contract to write the book. And then I got hired to uh, to do the music for Assassin's Creed Liberation. So I put the book aside and um, I, I'd already written a big chunk of it at the time. Mm -hmm. And I went to work with Ubisoft on the music for Assassin's Creed Liberation. And it was just amazing and inspiring. And um, it opened my eyes about a lot of things. And it uh, made me reevaluate some of my ideas about um, what's important as a game composer. And so after that, I went back and rewrote uh, most of <laughs> what I'd, yeah, most of what I'd written for the book uh, so that it would take into account all the stuff that I'd learned from that project. And um, I, I, I'm kind of glad that it worked out that way because I had a, a particular vision for, for what music was for games before. And then afterwards, I had some very different ideas, and I, I was able to sort of bring those two perspectives together and let them sort of meet in the middle um, for the for the book, so that it kind of addressed different um, approaches to to game music. So that I think was really cool, and I really enjoyed just writing the book because that was a thing that I loved about um, you know about Radio Tales. It focused on literature and. I had, in my younger days, thought I would be a writer. Um, <laughs> I you thought are. that was, well, yeah, uh, well, thank you. <laughs> I guess that's true. <laughs> I, I think I, I thought I was going to, yeah, when I was a youngster, I thought I was either going to uh, like write fantasy epics or I was going to be a composer for media. And I thought it, it, my, my life was either going to go one way or the other. And it went and it the music. Both. It, well, it, it kind of did. I suppose it did. I, I it, it was an opportunity to sort of use another part of myself, and I, I really appreciated the chance to do that. Yeah, yeah, uh, brilliant. You know, you've got some amazing scores under your belt. You've done some amazing things. I've seen you know, all that kind of stuff. And I, I, I genuinely, I think the stuff that you do is inspiring, um, and it's incredible. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate that. So I'm going to be really horrible and ask you a question. Um, the last one is because it was is so what is music for games? Oh, all right. Okay, this is a, <laughs> okay, okay, I'm gonna do it. All right. Music for games. I think there are two two main thoughts that um, that govern the philosophy of creating music for games. And one of them is that game music reflects the cognition of the player. That uh, when you are playing a game, you settle into very specific rhythms of thought and investigation, problem solving. You, um, you work, you, the gears of your mind rotate in specific rhythms. Uh, according to what you're trying to do, like whether you're in a strategy game and you're looking at a large playing field with a lot of simultaneous activities going on all around you and you're trying to keep track of it and solve all those problems, or you're in like a role playing game where you're in your following a quest, talking to characters, trying to maybe solve mysteries and that kind of thing, and being getting emotionally involved in the narrative and getting swept along with the momentum and all of that. There are different ways of, of thinking and, and reasoning your way through a, a path that's been created for you. And so one of the jobs I think of as my, um, my impetus as a game composer is to reflect and enhance the way in which players are are grappling with the the, the challenges that the game is presenting um, for 
for instance, I, I wrote a little bit about this on in my blog, the idea that um, music can create different modes of cognition. So uh, particularly for strategy games, I was talking about my work on a, a VR strategy game called Dragon Front. And, and I wrote a series of articles called um, uh, game music can make you smarter, in which I talked about <laughs> how uh, there are there are certain ways in which you can use tempo and rhythm and and pitch in order to uh, help players concentrate and focus on specific uh, tasks, uh, things that are distracting, things that are um, that help you focus or, or direct your attention, and things like that uh, really seemed like a meaningful way for me to contribute as a member of the development team in making the game more fun. And that's, you know, that's really a part of what we're all supposed to do as members of the team. What, no matter what our discipline is, whether we're creating visual art or, or whether we're creating audio assets or we're creating um, the, the gameplay mechanics, or in my case, creating the music, we're all trying to make the game more fun for players. So, um, so that is a, the, one of the big things you need to do as a game composer and something that I spent a lot of time thinking about but the other aspect, I think, is the idea of enhancing player agency. Um, and that's the other thing that makes gaming unique. Uh, gamers can make choices. They can, um, they can shape the direction of the narrative or they can, they, they can influence the outcome of the challenge and they can uh, leave their impress on the game. Uh, it, something they can't do in any other form of entertainment, uh, but they can do it in gaming. So for me as a composer, it, trying to create a sense of player agency by having my music react and respond to what they do mm -hmm. is uh, the other big aspect of my work as a game composer, um, making my music as fluid and uh, intellectual or experimental or reactive as their own journey is. Um, so that when they do something, uh, whether it's a conscious or unconscious recognition that the music has reacted to it, it still emphasizes the sense that they are powerful in what they're doing because the uh, all the entire fabric of their surroundings has has lifted and responded to their choice including the music so that's a, a, another big part of what i feel like a game composer needs to do. They need to think of music as a conversation between their work as a creator and the player's work as a as a solver of problems and a chaser of adventure. So, um, so that's uh, the, I think those are the two main aspects of what game music is. How game music is different for music from any other form of entertainment. Game music can reflect how you're thinking as a player, and game music can emphasize the fact that you have choice. Amazing. Thank you. I think that serves as a very good end of the show. Um, it just really leaves me to say thank you. Best of luck with everything that you do. Um, we always look forward to what you're hearing. I know that you've got new stuff coming. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. I really appreciate it, Pete. And um, and thank you very much for inviting me to on your excellent show. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. I should have done that long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you again. I will leave you to your day. Thank you. Um, and that's the end of the show, folks. We will see you next episode very soon. Okay. <laughs>